Welcome to the Library Love Fest podcast. I'm Virginia Stanley. I'm Lainey Mays. And I'm Grace Catanolo. We are the library marketing team at HarperCollins Publishers. We bring librarians and great books together. The new year brings new offerings from our podcast. The first episode of the month will have book presentations, author interviews, voicemails from librarians like you, and more. And our mini episode halfway through the month features our Library Reads winners. Don't miss our winning author's acceptance speeches. Welcome and enjoy the show. Book Buzz, HarperCollins Book Buzz. Check it out. Book Buzz, HarperCollins Book Buzz. Brought to you by Library Love Fest. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Library Love Fest podcast. This is Lainey, and I'm joined by... Virginia and Grace. Hello, it's April, and we are here with our next podcast episode. We have had some fun. We had our last Library Reads episode that just came out. That was a a fun one. We posted Kate Morton's thank you video. Um, she also did a video, and that one got so many views on our Instagram. So thank you, Kate. That was fun. If you want to hear from the author, you can go listen to our last podcast episode. Oh, my God. I loved listening to her. Yeah. Really. Go back and listen to it. It's just like you just want to curl up with a blanket and have her read the phone book to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, We thought we have a really great interview for you, but we thought we would do something a little different instead of having an HC Harper Collins person on, we would just do a little what we're reading as the team. So who I know we've all talked about it before we went live here on the podcast to record. We were already talking about our books. So does anyone want to go first? Uh, I'll kick it off with a book that I'm thinking slash hoping most librarians would be very drawn to because the book is called The Librarianist and it's by Patrick DeWitt, who is wonderful. I'm sure you're all very familiar with him. Um, He's the author of French Exit and the Sisters Brothers and Under Major Domo Minor. He's just such a a brilliant writer and such a smart, just down to earth, just writer who brings these really funny, quirky situations, quirky characters um, to the page. And he's done it again here it's I think it's a little bit of a of a departure in a way from his other books because they're it's not so wacky as it is sort of endearing but um but infused with these characters who are who are definitely memorable and a little bit different uh and it's really about this man, a retired librarian, and I love his name his name is Bob Comet. And he um, he is uh, he's sort of an introvert and he's just, you know, he's a bookish fella and kind of going about his days. And one day he comes upon an elderly woman who is very confused and she's got a, a, a badge around her neck and which indicates that she's really supposed to be at this uh, senior citizen center and she's gotten herself lost. So he brings her back and then he meets all of these people that work there and um, and this community just opens up a world to him and the community opens up a world to the reader because you just, you see these different people and they're that, you know, what brought them there. But, but more importantly, you're really drawn to Bob Comet and you find out about his life and what's brought him to where he is today when he was a child and a young man and, um, and it's got humor and pathos and um, direction. And I just, I just love it. And Patrick DeWitt has just done a wonderful, a wonderful job drawing a picture of a person who was drawn to the world of books and to librarianship. And, um, and this is his life. So that's the librarianist and it's coming out in July. I love that. I had someone describe a movie I was watching as like slice of life the other day, which I really liked 
that and I've, I've heard it before but i've ne- i forgot about it is this something you would classify as that you know this like yeah. daily thing that he's doing but it goes in the past i don't know i like that yeah yeah and because he's you know i mean the sisters brothers is really kind of out there you know, mm. like those other books are, are a little bit out there. This is more sort of mainstream, mm. but everybody's got some out there people in their lives and everybody's got a history and a story. And, and this is Bob's. But I just love that it's all couched in the fact that he's a librarian and a bookish sort of introvert with this. He just drills down into his life. Mm. All right. You can also hear more from Patrick on our last uh, Writers to Watch episode for March. And that's on Crowdcast and Facebook, so you can go check that out on our social media. Yeah, thanks, Grace. Grace, what are you reading? I am reading The Happy Couple by Nisha Dolan, and she's the author of Exciting Times, which um, published a couple months after the pandemic, which was obviously not a easy time for anyone, but especially not to publish a debut. But it got wonderful reviews, sold a ton of copies. Um, it was a favorite of me and Lainey's and I wasn't even at Harper yet. So that was my honest uh, opinion. Um, and this is her second novel with us. It's called The Happy Couple. It's on sale in um, November, November 7th. So a bit of ways away, but I couldn't help myself um, to start reading. And it follows Celine and Luke. And they're this very like conventional average couple. But you find out very quickly um that Luke is this like serial cheater and um, Celine is a concert pianist who is very much more interested in her work than, um, you know, having this domestic life. But the book opens with them getting engaged and you kind of are like, okay, like both of you seem to be in love and happy, but um, you kind of just ended up in this situation. And I... I think this book is like a really sharp look on modern relationships and how um, people kind of just can fall in this conventional path. And what I love about this book is it kind of jumps between um, not first person point of views, but, you know, parts of the book are about different people in their lives. So we start off with Celine um, and her talking about her engagement and the engagement party, which is kind of a disaster and then we hear from Phoebe her sister who is this like I don't know how to describe her like pessimistic full of dread Gen Z and I I think she's my favorite character I find her very interesting and then we hear from Archie um, the best man who had a former relationship with Luke and is kind of trying to like get over um, his feelings for him and Every, I'm pretty sure every character that we meet, like Luke, Celine, Archie, and Phoebe are all queer. So there's really great queer representation. And I think it talks about queerness in a really um, interesting way that you don't see in a lot of books. It's very honest and raw. And I just really, I've been really enjoying um, these um, themes in it. And I'm obviously not finished with it, but I have heard that the ending is kind of uncertain and really not what you expect so I'm really excited to dive into this and this is all um, taking place in the year leading up to their wedding so I'm excited to see like does this wedding happen Um, I have opinions on whether or not I want it to but I'll keep those to myself and I just I think this is such a good book and I think a lot of people are really gonna like it it's a pretty unconventional marriage plot and that again is on sale in um, November, and I've been bugging Lainey to start it because I can't wait to hear what she thinks. I loved um, Exciting Times, and it was one of my favorites of that year, and I would scream from the rooftop. I was in Strand the other day, the bookstore in New York, and my friend was visiting, and I walked past it, and I audibly went, oh, I love this book so much. <laughs> you have to take it. And they're like, okay, okay, I will like that's hand selling for you but um I (laughs) I loved that book and I it was pretty short but it had a lot packed into it and it was like a really unique setting um but I told people that I I was like I'm not to oversell anything but I think it does for millennials what Hemingway did for the lost generation 
And I know that sounds lofty, but I mean it in a way that is it captures everything I was thinking, all the existential dread, what it is to live in this time when you're between two very different generations. You know, it was I don't know. I love that book. So I'm very glad you enjoyed it, Grace. Yeah, I I found it at a used bookstore and didn't even look at like the imprint, which I try to do because I, I don't know, I like to read from different houses and I didn't even notice that it was ours. And I started reading it, instantly loved it. I told Lainey about it and she was like, that's one of our books. Like I, I had no idea. And then I gave my used copy to a friend who also loved it. And I just think it's a really great book for millennials, but really any generation can read it and get something out of it. Um, it's also just like, she's a hilarious writer in this way that isn't like, I feel like it's very effortless. Like it's almost like she's not trying to be funny, but it just happens. And I, I'm really excited. I, it's bad. I'm already excited for her next book and I'm not even finished with this one. I love that. Love that. Yeah. That's really funny that you fell in love with the book that we publish. I hope you didn't buy it. I did. <laughs> It's okay with a used bookstore, a local used bookstore, supporting bookstores. Yeah, supporting books, love it. Yeah, Lainey, what are you reading right now? Well, I'm reading a book Virginia and I were talking about the other day, so we can both chime in. I'm reading *The Leftover Woman* by Jean Kwok. We love Jean Kwok; she's fantastic, uh, just a wonderful soul. But writes a really amazing book. She's the author of the New York Times bestselling book, um, Searching for Sylvie Lee. She also wrote Girl in Translation. And this new book is, it it pulled me in so quickly. It's about two women. It starts off with Jasmine. She has just arrived in New York City um, from China, small town there, small village. And she doesn't have any support. She's kind of made her way over in a sketchy way she has to pay some people back that she's worried about um but she's all she's done all of this in an effort to find her daughter who was taken from her she got married really young it goes into a lot of details um on that relationship and she's looking for this daughter that she didn't even know um was missing until recently And she's come to New York. She has to pay these people back. And she runs into someone she knew from her childhood. And so there's a little, you know, light romance in it as well as they reconnect. And she is needs quick money. So she starts working for, you know, a a seedy, seedy place. um, And she's being she's waitressing, scantily clad waitressing. Um, But she so while she's doing all this, you see also a woman named Rebecca, who's a publishing executive. She kind of seems to have it all. She has this wonderful husband who they met when they were he was studying abroad in China and she was visiting China and they met and came over. And now they have they're kind of the power couple. He's professor. She uh, works on all these books and then they adopt a little girl from China. And so on the outside, it looks like she has it all, but slowly you figure out that maybe, maybe the cracks are forming. She's not getting the book she wants. So she's trying to acquire this new author, her nanny, who was hired to speak Chinese around her daughter, become more of a mother figure than she'd like. Her husband has, is acting a little weird. So, you know, what's really going on? Um, And as you see these two women intersect and and run parallel lives um you really get a a good view of new york in this time in china growing up and having a very different system and it's a really beautiful read i'm really enjoying it and um yeah i don't know if virginia you want to say anything about it just that i think that she is she's just such a wonderful writer. You know, she's, we've met her some several times and she comes in with an energy um, and a light and a real presence, you know, and that, and it's, um, it's really refreshing and her books reflect all of that. Um, But it's, it's kind of, I don't know, I guess because we see her, when we see her face to face, she is all up and bubbly and funny and and the books that she writes are beautiful, but there's always, you know, there's 
it's hard hitting stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's important and it's beautiful. And there's, these are stories that have to be told. And uh, she's, she's just as brilliant a writer as she is as lovely a person. I guess so a lot. That's a really one I want to say yeah. about, about Jean Kwok. She's just, she's a force of nature in person and on the page. Jean's good vibes are really infectious. I feel like after I met her for the first time in person in the office a few weeks ago, and like she just has the most infectious energy. Yeah, we're big fans of Jean here. So I can't wait to finish it. And speaking of wonderful authors talking about their books, we had a really cool interview. I'm going to hand it to Grace to tell us about it. We heard from uh, Rakia Clark and her author, Wesley Lowry, the author of American White Lash. And it was just, Lainey and I were just sitting there in awe listening to them. I told them that if they want to quit their day jobs, that they could be great podcasters. And I think you're all going to agree that they are just a joy to listen to and very insightful. And I'm going to leave it to them. We have a very special treat for you. We have an editor-author conversation this is a very special relationship, and we're so excited to dive deep into a book and hear about um, this, this wonderful relationship from the two people who can speak best about it. So I'm going to introduce our editor from HarperCollins and do a little background, and then we will get right into that interview. So uh, we are joined today by Rakia Clark. Hi, Rakia. Hi. Hi. Rakia Clark is an executive editor at Mariner Books. She works mostly on serious, literary, and narrative nonfiction. Her list includes Punch Me Up to the Gods, a memoir by Brian Broom, which won the Kirkus Prize for Nonfiction, Invisible Storm by Jason Kander, about overcoming PTSD after surviving in Iraq and entering American politics. That was a New York Times bestseller. And she published White Lies by A.J. Bame, a powerhouse biography of Walter F. White, who led the NAACP to public prominence and was once the most influential Black man in America. She's happy to be making her debut on our podcast. And I, uh, such a great list of books. Um, Punch Me for the Gods was fantastic. I know they got like so many reviews. Oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's one of my favorites too. Oh, it was lovely. And I'm going to hand it over to Grace to, um, to, to start us off. I'm really excited for your conversation today. And in addition to all of those amazing works, you're the editor of American White Lash by Wesley Lowry, who is here with us today. Without further ado, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Lainey. Thank you, Grace. I'm delighted to be here in conversation with Wesley Lowry. Wesley is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author, and on-air correspondent. He currently works as a contributing editor at the Marshall Project and a journalist in residence at the CUNY Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. And a decade as a national correspondent, Wesley has specialized in issues of race, justice, and law enforcement. He led the Washington Post team that was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting in 2016 for the creation and analysis of a real-time database to track fatal police shootings in the U.S. His project, Murder with Impunity, an unprecedented look at unsolved homicides in major American cities, was a finalist for another Pulitzer Prize in 2019. His first book, They Can't Kill Us All, Ferguson, Baltimore, and a New Era in America's Racial Justice Movement was a bestseller all over the place and won some prizes too. I am predicting that Wesley's new book, the one we're about to discuss, will have a similar trajectory. That book is American White Lash, A Changing Nation and the Cost of Progress. It's out on June 27, 2023. I couldn't be more excited to chat about this book with the brilliant mind behind it. Wesley, welcome. Oh, thank you. That was too kind. We don't have to talk about anything else. We can just leave it at that. <laughs> word. We're good to go. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. You know, it's the it's the that lull between the finally kind of finishing the manuscript, finishing the work, having that kind of looming 60,000 word deadline that's been on your shoulders for however many years release. And then also the feeling of okay, we go in June. And so I got to do everything I want to do for the whole year. <laughs> That's not the right. book between right. now and June. Right. Um, it's, so it's been a fun, interesting calm before the storm, but it's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, we're at go time now. It's a different kind of go time. It's yes, exciting. It um, so anybody could be listening to this and I hope many, many people are, but our audience here is librarians. 
Did you grow up going to the library? Were you a librarian? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I was very, I very proudly won the summer reading contest at the Teaneck Public Library in Teaneck, New Jersey, um, probably as many years as I was allowed to enter it. Um, <laughs> I still know you're only allowed to take out 20 books at a time. And so I had a whole system where each morning I would take out my 20 books and then I would lay my uh, my uh, <laughs> blanket outside. I could also, you could take out 20 books, but you could also take out CDs or other media. And so I would take out CDs for music I didn't have and listen to them on my little CD player and sit outside and, and read these books all day, every day. And then every few days, my mom would take me back and I would swap it out for 20 more books. So yes. That's a long way of saying that, yes, um, I, I was a big library person. I still remember getting my first library card, both in New Jersey and Teaneck. And then when I moved out to Cleveland later, uh, was a big, um, I was near one of our branches. And so I would walk over there a lot. Wow. Do you remember who your favorite authors were to check out when you were growing up? That's it. That's interesting. You know, it's really hard for me because I, I actually don't I have a few specific books I remember, but I don't even know that at the time they were my favorite. So I know that I I you so I read a lot of like C.S. Lewis. So I did a lot of like The Lion Witch in the Wardrobe and like that in the Chron the Chronicles series. I did I read, I was really into biography for a long time. So I did a lot of historical You're biography. A serious kid, biography. Yeah, always, kid? always. It's my curse, right? Like it's like I everyone's like, what do you do for fun? And I'm like, watch Nazi documentaries. What do you guys do for fun? <laughs> There was Derek Jeter uh, had an autobiography. I'm sure he co-wrote it. I, I, I had no idea with whom uh, that, but that was targeted to younger audiences called The Life You Imagine. And I think I did that for a book report every year for three or four straight years. Um, and so I read that one a lot. Um, but yeah, I was a reader and a rereader. Wow. I thought you were going to say someone like Walter Dean Myers or Blair Beverly Cleary or. No, and I did do, I did do Walter yeah. Dean Myers and I did do Roll of Thunder here. I mean, I, 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 I kind of touched on all of them, but I didn't have, like I said, I, for me, I always kind of wanted to like read all of it in a weird way. And so I, yeah. I was not someone who like had a series or an author where I like read all of them. It's like, I kind of touched on a bunch of different books here and there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you were a reader, and that makes sense for the work that you're doing now. Like, it seems like it probably made quite an impression if you're reading 20 books at a time outside, you know, and winning awards consecutive years. When I think about your body of work, no matter the medium, and you work in television, you work in digital, you work in newspapers, magazines, all these different places, I think of you as reporter first, you know, going to get important stories that no one else is getting, maybe in places that no one else is looking. Is reporter how you see yourself first? Yes, it's definitely how I see myself and how I think about it. You know, I've got friends who see themselves as writers, I have friends who see themselves um, as like as thought leaders or public, com you know, commentators or, you know, I, I really do see myself as a reporter. Now, that doesn't mean that I exclusively write in the more traditional journalistic ways. I definitely do essay and can do first person and, have, you know, now even doing correspondent work on television, there are times where it matters that I'm the one asking the question and there's a moment made of that. But I really do, for me, so much of this has always been about the act of asking people questions and, and asking questions of society in the place where we, um, where we live and less about my kind of rumination on it right and so i and i still i mean it's something i actually like actively wrestle with internally sometimes of when do i lean in versus when do i kind of let it play itself out and, you know for the reader what's the attraction to it for you to reporting you know i think for me and i and i've been reporting since i was in seventh or eighth grade i was with my middle school newspaper my high school newspaper and my and so i'm going on like four decades <laughs> however long it is right wow. but the but for me, there was something about the idea that I could wake up in the morning with any question in the world, and I could spend all day calling people who know the answers and asking them those questions, and then and then recording in my own voice, writing up what those answers were and making the question make sense, that that could be a job just felt like cheating, right? That like my job every day is to learn things by stealing knowledge from other people. And, and experiences. And so as a reporter, all right, I get to talk to people who have expertise, 
who have experience. I get to go places other people don't go. I get to sit down and ask these questions and and people just answer them. And that to me, that just seems like way more fun than me sitting here at my desk telling you what you should think about stuff. It's like, no, I want to go out there and talk to all these people and learn what they've experienced and then translate it. Like I think as a reporter, you're a translator in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. You're taking experience or an expertise and you're translating it out to a bigger, broader audience. So is, is this the job that you always wanted to have reporting? It is. It is. I mean, I it's interesting because I have very literally had specifically some of the jobs I always wanted to have. And so now I have to invent new ones to want to have. Um, but it but I think in some ways I did always kind of think about it as the task and less about the title or the position. Right. And then a lot of ways it was about what do I want to be doing every day and and how do I and I really love learning. I love experiencing things. I love building relationships with people and like having intimate relationships with people, right? And that like, you really know who I am. I really know who you are. And so because of that, it this job allows me to go places and sit across from folks and really, and ask them anything and really get into that space. And, and that, I don't know, for whatever reason, that's the thing for me that helps me really feel and understand the world. Sure. Now, I think the difference between you, everything that you're saying and other people is they're not always good at it. Where did you <laughs> know that you were good at the reporting? Not just the curious mind who had these questions you wanted answers to, but that you were really good at getting the answers and then synthesizing that for other people. Um, Honestly, that, that truly has probably been a more recent realization. I mean, like, today, I am aware. Like, oh, I'm, I'm good at this. I can do this, right? Uh, and do it well. Um, I think that for a very long time, it, it took me a long time and frankly, probably going out on my own. You know, I've always been a staff member somewhere up until just a year or two ago, where now I mostly freelance in addition to the work that I'm to the to the teaching I'm doing. And I think that part of it was the blessing and the curse of working for these great institutions, which I which I still love and still do a lot of work with them, be it the Washington Post or the 60 Minutes or the wherever, is that you the blessing is that you have all the resources and and the the talent in the room that you're sitting across from people who you admire and who do this at this very high level. Um, but the curse in some ways is you don't know how good you really are on your own. Hmm. How much of this is the institution saving me <laughs> over and over and over again? And right. And have I just learned to rig the system enough so that it makes me look better than I, you know, and, and to be clear, there are people for whom that's true. <laughs> right. And so you never quite know. And I think what's been interesting for me is being out there more on my own and saying, all right, I want to write about this, or I want to go to this place, or I want to tell this story, and being basically empowered to do it. It really, it tests you in a different way, because it's, do you, do I really have the juice? Can I really pull this off? Yeah, I'm gonna, I get that, I get there. that. It's also the proximity to an institution that can grant you access, that right. without it, now you've got to, like, can I get the access on my own? And I, and I play around with that. And that's really interesting as well, right? And, and, and that cuts both ways, right? The institutions very often provide access. In some cases, the institutions, it can work in the opposite direction too, right? Where you're trying to go do a piece for the Post or the Times or wherever, and the person you're wanting to talk to is currently mad at the Post or the Times for whatever thing yeah. it is. Pick your thing in whatever direction. So there certainly are times uh, where it can be helpful to not have the institution, although I'm not someone who underestimates. I mean, I really revere the doors that are open because of those institutions. What is also true, though, is, you know, if reporting is in a lot of ways about trafficking in information and trafficking in intimacy, being able to get people to tell you things and reveal themselves to you, it's human. Who do I know who knows this person? Who do I know? What is my reputation that helps me get in this room or in this door? And so I also think, frankly, as a Black reporter and writer who was always writing for traditional mainstream news organizations, which is to say white news organizations, I always had to traffic in spaces where it was me getting in the door, not necessarily the institution. Sure. Right? Sure. And that, and, and so because of that, to do the things that I do, now, if I want to go do a thing about Congress, it's going to be more helpful to do it for the Post or X, Y, and Z, right? Or the White House or X, Y, and Z. But if I'm just going into the neighborhood, I'm walking in looking like I look and, and moving the way I move and knowing the people I know and whether and it doesn't really matter who I'm writing for it or how I'm writing for it. And and so so like I said, it can kind of be double edged and it can be interesting. Um, you know, like I said I feel very fortunate that I'm in a space where I'm able to I've been able to build a following 
and a reputation and in some ways an expertise in a specific space that allows me to move the way I move. But I also understand not everyone could necessarily do it that way. Sure, sure. Well, you bring all of that to bear, you who you are as a person, your reporting expertise, proximity to power, proximity to institutions, all of that to bear with American White Lash. Um, it's based on your reporting of terrible racist violence that happened in response to President Obama being elected um, back in 2008. And some folks just could not handle a Black man leading our country. And so there was a, a white backlash, hence the book's title, American White Lash. Um, so that listeners know a little bit about the book, I'm just going to give them a brief rundown. Uh, the book is divided into to five parts. And you, Wesley, you set up uh, the issue at the heart of the whole thing, which is white grievance. Then you focus in depth on a few different cases where grievance turned into something much more sinister and horrific. That's a location in uh, Kansas, Wisconsin, in New York, three individual cases. And then you close out with some activist movements that if you merge from these cases and from cases like them. Can you talk a little bit about why you wanted to write this book and what the reporting process was like for you? Of course. It, it, you know, it, it's interesting, having been a beat reporter now, frankly, almost for a decade, right? I've been in many ways writing the same story for, for a decade. And what you think about is, okay, well, how is this story, how is it changing? How is it shifting, right? That for a long time, my, my job was functionally to write about and to think about the anti-racist movement in America, whether that was manifesting in policing and law enforcement or in education or other spaces. And, and what became clear is how that, to tell that story, you have to expand your aperture to also tell the story of the movements and the backlash that arise in response to those movements and to that, and to that perception of, of progress. Um, you know, my first book, They Can't Kill Us All, was a book written about being a young Black reporter covering the early days of Black Lives Matter and um, and the protest movement and what it was like to be working inside a major media institution doing that and what it was like to navigate that coverage, how I learned and, and in many ways built expertise through the repetition of the coverage. And as you know, uh, when you finish a book, uh, everyone immediately starts going, so what's the next one? So what's going on? So when's your... So my book came out in November, it was November 15th, 2016. And so the week after Donald Trump was elected. And so at this very moment, I have a bunch of people asking me, what's next? And I've just finished this book about these young Black activists and this moment and the end of the Obama administration and what it was going to mean for racial activism and for the story of America and now it's what's next, what's next? And, and and we're preparing to inaugurate an openly nativist president. And I don't even mean that as a political statement. I just mean as a factual statement, someone who ran on an animus for immigrants, for Muslims, for people of color, um, and 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 as a and ran as a in using the Black Lives Matter protest as a foil, ran against their activism, what they were doing. And I began seeing in my job as a national correspondent then at the Washington Post, these incidents of racial aggression and racial violence, whether it be Muslim women being attacked on a subway in Portland, whether it be a rally of Nazis around the inauguration where, where they're making, they're using this, this racist iconography. And, you know, and so it became very clear to me that the next chapter of this story, of the story had already been told, was going to be looking at what happens next and 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 what and what comes in the midst of this election that in many ways to understand Donald Trump you have to understand Barack Obama to understand to understand Black Lives Matter you've got to understand the Obama election the Obama years and the Bush years but to understand what's what's happening now you had to understand all those things as well and so on the one hand it felt like a continuation second I took really seriously, you know, I'm I'm a, you know, I grew up working at newspapers and reading newspapers. I'm kind of a media, I'm a traditionalist in some ways, right? I'm I'm not a, you know, even though I'm digitally native and a child of the internet, got all the social media, you know, I I worked for newspapers, right? And so I I do really believe in the power of recording things, writing things down. And so what I also thought was, okay, we are about to enter. We didn't know exactly what it would be at the time, but we were about to enter an era 
right? Donald Trump is about to become the president of the United States. What do I, journalist Wesley Lowry, want to leave behind as an artifact from that era? What, how do I, what do I leave behind for history? And part of what felt important to me was that I used the gifts I have, whatever those are, to whatever extent they are, to be interviewing and telling the stories of the people who were victimized by the backlash, writing down the stories of the people who were the victims. And so while the cases I focus on are cases that were written about um, in, in other cases and other matters, it felt to me like they all deserved another look and more examination and deserve to be placed in a bigger, broader context, that these weren't one-off acts of violence, uh, that they were a roster of victims um, who who were victim, not just to the perpetrators of the attacks, but victims to the this moment in our politics, this moment in our history, this moment in our racial struggle about who we are going to be as a nation. What, what made you pick the ones that you picked? Because there were so many. Well, I knew from the beginning, I didn't come in with a list of which ones I was going to do. I had some ideas of things I thought were interesting or places I might want to poke around, but the list was very different initially than where I landed. Part of it was I wanted to, one, reflect the totality of racialized violence, right, which we know is not just anti-Black violence, just not just anti-Muslim violence, not just anti-immigrant violence, not just anti-Semitic violence, right? I knew that very often we bite them off this way. Right. So you write a book about anti-Semitism or you write a book about anti-immigrant or you write a book about anti. But the reality is that the our white supremacist history in the United States of America and white supremacist violence, frankly, doesn't make those differentiations. Right. We're all victims to the same racist conspiracy theory ideology. Right. And so to understand what happens in Buffalo in the supermarket. You also have to understand what happens at Tree of Life in the synagogue. And then you also have to understand what happens in the Sikh temple, um, you know, in Wisconsin. And so all of these things in many ways factor together. So that was the first thing I was thinking about. I wanted to make sure I touched on all of this. Second, I wanted to lean into these questions of, of what is our response collectively in the United States? to this, whether it be a law enforcement response, what has our response been historically? How do the perpetrators fit into our historical narrative, uh, which is interesting to me. And and because I think very often we were like, oh, these are new Nazis and they wear suits and they tweet things. And these were Klansmen, the same ideologies, same backgrounds, sharing the same racist pamphlets is just on the internet instead of ma snail mailing it, right? And so I wanted to get at that historical core as well. I think sometimes we have a presentism where we where we believe that what's happening today is special and different. And in fact, it's the same thing that's always happened. And that becomes paralyzing where we don't actually uh, respond to it because of it. And, and then third, to the frustration of every editor I've ever worked for, I also kind of let the story guide itself. And so I don't know where I'm going when I set off to do it. And so this case leads to another one. It leads to another one. Now I need to make a phone call. And now I need to do this. And now oh, here's a new chapter here. And and so I wanted to give it some space to kind of guide itself through, um, you know, and so ultimately ended up focusing really on the decade after Obama was elected, really kind of 2007 to 2017, although there's certainly allusion to some things that happened beyond it. Um, and also wanting to try to tell something specific and specifically different with each example, right? And so it's not encyclopedic. There's not, um, it would be impossible to do this book in an encyclopedic way without doing big chapters on Tree of Life or big chapters on El Paso, right? Both incidents that that we mentioned, we talk about, but that are not actually the major focuses. And so that was part of how I try to think of it strategically and from a storytelling perspective. Sure. How long did it take you to to report it out before you get to the marinating, resting, sort of figuring out what the you know what the the premise of the book is going to be, but until you report it, you don't know what the narrative is going to be. How long just did it take for the reporting? So I was reporting frankly, all the way to the end. And and so I, I probably ended up spending probably about three years total. Now, I was doing it in bursts. I was working and doing lots of other reporting while I was doing this. But I, yeah, it was probably about three years in total. And, and in a lot of ways, kind of reporting section by section and incident by incident, 
drilling in and understanding what happens in the specific case and how it responded and confirming things and then doing a bunch of reading and reading the other book and, and then setting those chapters down and going to another one and and then popping back and going, okay, well, now what I learned here informs what I know up here, how I should set this up. And so, you know, it really was right until the end and, you know, in a very traditional reporting sense, if you gave me another month, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be in there tweaking sentences. I'd be there, I'd be making phone calls, right? All right, what if I can get one more person to talk about this thing? Or what if I built out an extra character here? And so that's always how I've kind of thought about it. Uh, doesn't, <laughs> like I said, can make for a chaotic editing process, but, um, but I think that it, you know, I really do like to let the story kind of un un unspool itself, you know, through the process. Now, considering by the time American Whitelash hits bookshelves, it will be almost a year, nearly a year since you finished writing it. With everything you just said, how brutal is that process where you finished it, the book is locked, but now you've got to wait. You know, we're sort of gearing up now, you know, in the weeks uh, and months ahead of the book's publication for you to be talking about it and, and sharing it with the world in, the, in this way. But the book has been locked for a long time. It is. I, I think that, frankly, this was one of the reasons I thought it was important in some ways to cap the time frame of the book at 2017. Again, not that we don't allude to other things, but that that because I think sometimes when you're writing, and I, I say this as someone who reads a lot of nonfiction books and has a lot of nonfiction writer friends, when you're writing something that is happening and playing out in real time, and I felt this with my first book as well, there's this sense of like, how do I make it fresher? How do I make it fresher? How do I make it fresher? That's impossible. At some point, you've got to stop and then wait for at least half a year, probably longer, right? And so for me, I was thinking a lot about how do I make sure this is thematically true and thematically grounded and rooted? Because no matter what the specifics of what's happening at that time, there'll be something happening in the moment of publication that this is relevant to. We'll be approaching, we'll just pass the anniversary of the attack in Buffalo. Um, we, we've recently seen attacks, attempted attacks on power grids and else, you know, that that this remains. Well, I mean, I, I say this sometimes, right? Like when you're, if you're actually right, like history proves you, proves you that way, right? And so you're, and, and so, and, and so, and that's a little too dismissive. Like, well, I just, I just know what I'm saying is correct. So it's not going to matter when it publishes because it'll still be relevant. That's, uh, I, I have more anxiety than that, right? But there's this sense of how do I think about the context of when this enters the world? We'll be at that point in the heart of the presidential primaries. And much of what the book talks about is how, how the politics and the rhetoric of our contemporary politics and our mainstream politics, how it fans the flames of these more insidious parts of our society. Will be like I said. Unfortunately, we know there will be ongoing attacks and ongoing incidents like this. And in each one of those moments, there will be reason to have conversation about it. And so that's part of what I'm thinking about is trying not to be as worried about what's in the book, not in the book, but thinking about how does how does the as I was writing it, how do I make sure that it's just foundationally true and solid so that it can be read even when it's a year out of date or two years out of date and still holds itself up as a primer. And secondarily, how am I just as an author and as someone who's going to be out talking about it publicly, how do I make sure I'm aware of what's still happening in this space? Sure. Wesley, thank you so much for your time. It has been an honor to work with you. I cannot wait for listeners to hear this conversation you and I have had and for readers to finally finally get to to read what what I know is going to be an incredible book and um, make quite a splash in a couple of months when it when it comes out. Thank you, sir. No, thank you. And I can't wait for people to hear it. And we love libraries. And so all the librarians out there should let us know. Uh, they um, happy to come come talk and, and, and make sure they got copies of the book. And I just want to say, if either of you want to quit your day, day jobs and become podcasters, I'm your guaranteed listener. Uh, that was such a joy to listen to and very, very rich conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're kind. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Rakia. Fabulous questions. Um, Wesley, amazing. This book is, is going to be such a great resource for libraries. And I'm so glad you hit on timeliness because unfortunately... I think we're going to continue having these conversations and a lot of these conversations are happening in libraries. So I'm, I'm excited to share this conversation with our librarian friends and everybody else listening. And I 
love what you said about being a translator as a reporter. That was fantastic. That was great. He has such great passion for what he does. And I agree, Grace. It was infectious. I just wanted to to stay on the phone all day and listen to what they said. All righty. So we've got stuff going on. We have. So hopefully people have been watching or checking out our Writers to Watch program, which we host once a month um, at uh, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, wherever that is where you live. And it's four authors. They're live and um, they're talking about their books and we're taking questions from viewers. So um, we've had I mean, we just started this this year and we have thousands and thousands of views. Um, so that's very encouraging. I think that the it's it, not only is the good timing that people are back at work. So we're doing this at night. People can have a co- cocktail if they want to. Um because they're not at work, but um, but but also the caliber of the authors is really wonderful. So we've go back and listen to them. We've had you know Patrick Dewitt and Laura Lippman and Gail Sukiyama and Jacqueline Winspear. We've just said you know we've had um, seasoned authors, debut authors mixed up together and just really really cool conversations. And so um, on April twentieth, we're going to have uh, four authors who are going to be talking about their books. We're going to have Kim Van Alkemade talking about her book, Counting Lost Stars. And she's the author of Orphan Number 8, which was a New York Times bestseller years ago. So when I saw her name on our publishing schedule to come out with this book, I was super jazzed because Orphan Number 8 was amazing. Um, And uh, this new book is about... uh, um, a college student who has given up her baby for adoption and she helps a Dutch Holocaust survivor search for his lost mother. So um, this is, she does her homework. She's a great researcher, a really effective writer. We also have uh, Lena Andrews, uh, her book, Valiant Women. Um, that one's going to be really exciting. It's our nonfiction on the panel. So I'm really excited to hear from her. Yeah. And then we have two other historical fiction authors, Mona Susan Power, Council of Dolls. That one's a super powerful book. Um, Native American Women, Three Generations. Then we have Canary Girls by Jennifer Chiaverini, um, Women in World War II. I, I love that all of these books are women and their stories throughout history. Grace, what did yeah. you say the other day about the Venn diagram? What were you saying about <laughs> I was hoping that went over well and then it stuck with people. So thank you for bringing that up, Lainey. I was talking about Valiant Women specifically, but I was saying that this book was really great for fans of unsung heroes, forgotten history, and women's history. And that if we had three circles and they were supposed to be a Venn diagram, it would just be one circle. Um, so I'm, I'm just really excited to hear from her and all the other authors as well. I think all of them are touching on you know similar topics in very different ways. So I think it's going to be a really interesting panel and group of people it's gonna be great yeah we also have uh our typical book buzz coming um that's galley gap fest on april 18th that's at 2 p.m eastern time and we're just gonna be gabbing and chatting and i think one of my favorite parts about this is when librarians interact with us during it so i'd love for you to pop in and leave us a comment all right well before we leave we have our voicemail for the month Someone called in answering our question. Remember, you can see our question on our socials. We ask one question a month. If you want to send it in one answering this month's question, which was what's your favorite library display you've ever had or seen? doesn't have to be your own. Um, if you want to send those in, you still can. We have one more episode this month, and then you you get a new question for May. So send those in, but uh, before we leave you, we have a voicemail. I'm going to play it. Hi, this is Tracy Nielsen, assistant librarian at Grace Lake North High School Library Hub. And I am, my favorite display is the 23 Reads in 2023. You can do it. Uh, Encouraging students to read for fun with teacher and staff recommendations. Thanks. I love that. That's super simple, but if someone told me a challenge of 23 reads to read in 2023, I would be like, challenge accepted. I can do yeah, that. Yeah, for sure. That's cool. I like that. Very motivating. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one. Yeah. 
I say, take that listeners and run with it. Make your own challenge. Base yeah. it on a number that resonates with you and your library or your life. And uh, I think goal setting, goal setting is the way to go. If we don't have goals. It's so easy to just not do anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed this um, episode and we hope you'll join us again for Galley Gab Fest, Writers to Watch in our next podcast recording. So until then, keep on reading. We need a, we need a sign out tag. We need one of those. What is it called? Like there's teasers mm. and then there's like, I don't know, whatever they're called, like, you know, a, be good to yourself. Bye-bye. One of those a things. Sign off. Yeah. A and sign an off. outro. Like, oh, um, we should do that might be the song. next question. What should our sign off be, everyone? Oh, <laughs> I like it. Yeah. What's the best book related podcast sign off? I love it. Call in yeah. and let us know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love that. Okay. <laughs> Until then, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Library Love Fest podcast. For more information, go to librarylovefest.com. Enjoying the show? We would love to hear what you think. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Library Love Fest, on Instagram and TikTok at Harper Library. And you can always give us a call and leave us a message. You might end up on the show. That number is 212-207-7773. Be sure to rate and review us and share the show with a friend. Until next time. (laughs) 